really appreciate worship this morning, music. So thank you, team. The box before you contains every sermon I have preached since 2003. But given that I have been a pastor since 1996, that means that there are seven years worth of sermons that are missing. Now, I imagine that somewhere in this world there is a sermon thief ring. I believe that somewhere in this world there could be those that go around stealing sermons and and that they found those sermons to be so good that they stole seven years' worth. Now, while that is possible, I think the better guess is that the disappearance of those sermons, seven years' worth, the better guess is that is probably an act of God's mercy. You see, as I recall, they were long. Like, I hope y'all didn't leave anything on the stove because your house is probably burned down by now, sort of long. Um, But of these remaining 600 sermons, give or take, though I put 100% effort into each one, for each message I spend upwards of 20 hours. Spend upwards of 20 hours praying, studying, writing, typing, and memorizing. Every sermon you hear on Sundays, you can guarantee that somewhere between 15 and 20 hours has been put into that single message. And even though that's true with each of these in this box, I can tell you that of the 600 or so that are in here, really, I only remember probably elements to about a dozen of these. (laughs) Only probably about 12 sermons out of all those do I really remember much about. Yet by no means is this to say that that dozen or so, it's not to say that those are the best sermons that I have ever preached. No, I remember a few because they provided me some sort of epiphany an aha moment of personal spiritual growth. One of these messages I recall as perhaps my worst sermon ever. In here somewhere is the worst sermon ever. I have a pretty good idea where it is, and it stays buried. I mean, it was one of those that on paper, and I put in the time, 15 to 20 hours, I put in the time on this message, and and on paper it looked wonderful. It it looked crafty, in fact, like, oh, that's good. But then about midway through, it became a midair disaster is what it became. And I wonder if you know how that feels. I mean, I know we're lower this morning, but imagine as we have more people in here, and if you're up here preaching, and halfway through the sermon, you're like, oh, wow, this is really, really bad. (laughs) And everyone knows it, okay? That's not a good feeling to have when you're standing up here, all right? But one of those sermons, I remember that quite well. And then for a few more, out of that small group that I remember much about, a few more of those stand out to me as timeless challenges, meaning they apply across the board no matter the congregation. I could present them to any congregation, and to every person in there, it would stand as a challenge to each one. Now, of this last group, one message in particular has been on my heart for nearly six months. I mean that at least every couple of weeks, I think about this particular message, so much so that I was compelled to dig it out. I had to search through uh, much of this pile right here until I arrived at it, 
And I can tell you that it is a sermon from 2012. So it's six years old. But it has been on my heart to such an extent that I was compelled, which means I really feel like I was led by the Lord to dig it out, to look it over, to really rework it completely, and to present it again this morning. A six-year-old sermon. And you say, well, don't you? No, I don't ever do that. I mean, guys, look, this is from 2003. Okay, almost every sermon you hear, very, very rarely have I ever drawn from a past message. Once in a great while. Today is one for the last six months. I knew that I was going to be presenting it again this morning. But this is not to say that it's one of my best. It's not to say that it's one of my brightest. In fact, I would tell you that it's rather basic, a rather basic message. But on this special day of the Christian calendar, Passover, I believe the message today challenges each of us, every single one of us, to consider who it is we are expecting. Because I can guarantee you this, everyone is expecting someone on this day who if you would stand with me please let's turn to our text from Matthew chapter 21 Matthew chapter 21 we're going to look at verses 1 through 11 now you have to remember that before I ever came here I spent five years at a first congregation. They're the ones that got those. Wow. They still exist today. So it's, uh, I guess that's a good thing. <laughs> Matthew chapter 21. Starting with verse 1. Remember, this is Palm Sunday. Some of your Bibles might list this as the triumphal entry. For those that are unaware, uh, this by and large, is the last time that Jesus would enter Jerusalem. Okay, of course, we know that on Friday, we call it Good Friday um, because of the crucifixion. Well, how is that good? Because the greatest good was done that day that Christ paid a price. And, and then we know that Sunday is Easter, uh, uh, celebrating the resurrection. But as for today... We call this Palm Sunday, which you understand here in just a little bit. Matthew 21, verse 1, As they approached Jerusalem and came to Bethpage on the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, Go to the village ahead of you, and at once you will find a donkey tied there with her colt by her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, Tell him that the Lord needs them and he will send them right away. Now, that's kind of like in Star Wars where, where the Lord says, if anyone says anything to you, just kind of tell them these are not the droids you're looking for, okay? So just kind of say, so. Jesus says, let them know and, and he will send them right away. And then scripture says right here, he says, this took place to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet and it refers to the prophet Zechariah who said, say to the daughter of Zion, See, your king comes to you gentle and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. Now stop there for just a second again, because what we find here is a, is a tremendous element within the New Testament. Uh, Jesus is meeting prophecy. Okay, prophecy, the Old Testament, as I like to think about it, is a big neon sign that points to the New Testament, that points to Jesus and there are many prophecies that were made about the Messiah, the coming one. Okay, And so what we find here is that Scripture is noting for us that here is just one example of where Jesus met the prophecies concerning the Messiah. So it's important that we pay attention to that. The disciples went and did as Jesus had instructed them. They brought the donkey and the colt, placed their cloaks on them, and Jesus sat on them. A very large crowd. Now, I've seen crazy numbers for this crowd. I've seen from, a, you know, like 600 to up to 150,000. What this really means is that nobody knows exactly how many people were there along, you know, lining the road that day. 
what we know is that it was just a very large crowd. Spread their cloaks on the road, while others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. The crowds that went ahead of him and those that followed shouted like what we sang today. They shouted, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. As Miss Kathleen pointed out, that particular word Hosanna means save or save us we pray. But it was a celebratory cry at this point. When Jesus entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred and asked, Who is this? The crowds answered, This is Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth in Galilee. Father, we come to you in prayer this morning in the name of this same Jesus. And we just read about coming into Jerusalem, fulfilling prophecy with regards to the Messiah, the one who knows what's around the corner while the rest of us only see straight ahead. Father, we come to you in his name. It's the only way that we can approach the throne. We can't get there. We can't get there in the name of, but I'm a good person. We can't get there in the name of, of, of any other kind of false idol that we can think about or, or money. We can't pay enough money to stand before the throne. We can't have a certain kind of look about us or a talent about us. Or the fact that we've given X amount of hours to helping in this area or that area. It's not how we can come to the throne. There is only one way, and that is coming to the throne in the name of Jesus, your only begotten Son. Father, thank you for loving us. Thank you for sending to us your only begotten Son. You didn't have to. But you did. And you knew. You knew what kind of scoundrels we are. And yet you still sent your son. And he still made that trip into Jerusalem. And he knew. He knew what was coming. And you knew, Father. But you also knew it was the only way. It was a trip that had to be made. And that's how much you love us. We thank you. We ask, Lord, I pray, I gladly pray for this congregation this morning, myself included. Lord, may each of our hearts be touched today. Just a reminder, again, of your love. I don't care what we've done, I, I, from the worst to the best, because quite honestly, whether we've missed the mark by an inch or we've missed it by a mile, we've all missed it. <laughs> we pray, Lord, that everyone here will know God loves me. He cares about what happens to me. He cares about what happens through me. And then, Lord, also help us to be challenged, please. There's something for each of us in this message today. Again, it is a timeless challenge. There's a reason why you had me dug it out. And yeah, much of it was reworked. But there's a reason why you had me to start with this. We are to be challenged today. And we are to consider who we are and where we are and how we are. And so, Lord, help us to bravely face that and then give us wisdom to know what to do next. We thank you for loving us. In Christ's name, amen. Providing some historic context, it had been roughly 400 years since the people last heard from God. I mean, can you imagine? I mean, I've gone through brief periods. I've been a Christian now for, for 25 years. And I've gone through brief periods to where it felt like I didn't hear from the Lord. But can you imagine 400 years of where it seems that, that God does not speak? Um, referred to as the silent years, this is the period that, that largely resides 
between the Old Testament and the New Testament. I mean, if you were to say, so what happened between that time? Because there's, there's a distinct uh, uh, spot in here that, that separates the Old Testament from the New Testament. It, it's, it's right there. There's your separation. And we say, so what happened between that time? And I would tell you, not much. Not much in the sense of God speaking to his people. God wasn't talking to prophets anymore. God wasn't speaking directly to the people, good, bad, or indifferent. God was silent. God went dark. He was off the radar. But then slowly, over the course of three years, word began to spread of one who performed miracles taught with anointing, and definitely was not afraid to rock the boat of the establishment. As such, people began to question if this might be the Messiah. People began to wonder if this might be the one that they had been waiting for, this, this 400-year period. And they knew, again, the Old Testament looking ahead to the Messiah, but then God went silent for 400 years? Is he ever going to come again? Is, is the prophecies of the Old Testament, are they going to be met? And so over a three-year period, there's the one, and word begins to get out. There's no Facebook, there's no Instagram, there's none of that, and yet still word begins to spread of this one. And now here he comes. And the people wonder, has God chosen to speak to us again? So as Jesus entered Jerusalem, a large crowd excitedly lined his path with their cloaks, signifying royalty and palm branches, symbolizing Jewish nationality or nationalism, I should say. And, and I've always likened this because I like to get mental pictures, mental images, and I liken this um, Palm Sunday uh, event as though you and I with thousands of other people were along a main thoroughfare in Washington, D.C., and here comes the president's motorcade, and this is a president that people have placed so much hope in, and, and they believe that he's going to do so many good things, and we all have our hopes and aspirations differences in him but but we are cheering for him we're happy for him and as his motorcade comes down that main thoroughfare of Washington DC there we are along the side and we're waving our American flags this is how I envision this uh, this event this Palm Sunday and I would tell you that by this humanity got it right the way that they celebrated Christ's arrival Humanity got it right, which is usually not the case. No, from our earliest days, popular opinion has frequently missed the mark. It was wrong in the days of Noah. It was wrong when we started that construction of a Tower of Babel. It was wrong by often forsaking the prophet's messages, and it would be wrong many times over with the way it dismissed and denigrated the early church. But those who gathered on this particular day that you and I just read about, as Jesus entered Jerusalem, those folks, they got it right. But, as is often the case, the tide would soon turn. You see, within a matter of days, what started with those celebratory cries of Hosanna, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, and we're excited and we're celebrating this one that's coming down the main thoroughfare. Those same cries of Hosanna in just a matter of days would end with angry shouts of crucify. You see, that's how quickly things can turn. We shout Hosanna one day, and the next day it is crucified. That's what happened. And once more, popular opinion, popular opinion, missed the mark. Friends, the thing about Palm Sunday is that it offers you and I 
a unique perspective of both past and present. We find that the more things change, the more they stay the same. Just like 2,000 years ago, people today still imagine various things about Jesus. If you mention the name Jesus, and we've talked about it, you could say God. Okay, God is a very innocuous term. It, it, it just it doesn't hold a lot of weight these days. Okay, everyone believes in God of some sort. But when you say the name Jesus, when you get as crazy specific as to say Jesus, then everyone anticipates something. Something comes to their mind. And on this particular day, folks anticipated what Jesus might do for them. Certain freedoms that he might grant. But here's the thing. When people realize that the Lord's brand of freedom doesn't always match up with what they had in mind, Opinions can and often do change. Again, with the Messiah, everyone expects someone. What about us? Who are you expecting? Not the person next to you. Not the guy standing behind the pulpit. Not the worship team. Who are you expecting? When it comes down to it, though our text recounts an episode from long ago, in essence, we are there. Not we were there. We are there. You see, Jesus is still very present. And with four primary groups still lining the road, the timeless challenge is for you and I to determine which of these groups we stand with. Let me say it one more time. I'm going to give you four primary groups and our challenge is for us to determine which group we stand with not which group your spouse or your friend or the person seated next to you stands with no which group do you stand with and I'm asking myself which group do I stand with it matters well the first group consists of the devoted the devoted along with the Lord's inner circle of, of 12 disciples. Now remember, this inner circle, these, this band of brothers, originally consisted of 12, but Judas would soon leave them. Judas was with them as they entered. Judas heard the cries, Hosanna. But he would soon leave them. He was the betrayer. And I believe that Judas entirely had free will, but, but it was known what direction he was going to go. Still, as the Lord made his way there, the devoted, along with his inner circle of 12, this particular camp, the devoted, that would hold such people as, as ladies. There was this contingent, this group of ladies that had been traveling with Jesus since Galilee, um, as well as a large contingent of believers from the region of Jerusalem itself. And I was thinking about this. I, I have always imagined that Lazarus would have been part of that group. Lazarus whom Jesus had, had resurrected from the dead. I mean, when Jesus brings you back from the dead, you have a tendency to want to be where Jesus is. And so I believe that, that Lazarus would have been there. I believe that Lazarus' sisters, um, Mary and Martha, I believe that they would have been part of that group. And, and the Bible says, uh, I didn't give the scripture, but it's in there. It says that there were many more there that day that were part of that particular group. Having followed Christ for at least a portion of his earthly ministry, unlike all others, the devoted, the devoted knew well who they expected. They had heard his teachings and they accepted him as the promised hope. And isn't that what we all want? We want hope. When we no longer have hope, Nothing matters. And we read things in the newspapers or hear it, you know, online. The sad stories of those individuals that have lost hope. You can have all the money in the world. You can have all the trappings that the world affords. 
But if you don't have hope, you soon recognize that it just doesn't even matter. And these folks, the devoted, they accepted Jesus as the promised hope. Is this our group? Now understand, though we may falter at times, if you haven't realized this by now, you will. You as a Christian, you are going to falter. There are going to be times where you trip and you fall flat on your face. And you know what the devil does when that happens? The devil runs right up to the scene and he says things like hypocrite. You know, and it's almost like he stands up for Jesus. You know, you just gave Jesus a black eye. You better head the other direction before you give him another black eye. That's what the deceiver does. But you know what Jesus does? Jesus stops where he is. He turns around and he comes back to where we are. All splayed out on the ground. And he holds his hand down to us. And he loves us. And he tells us to take hold and to stand back up. The devil tells us to hightail it the other direction. And Jesus stops. He knows where we are, who we are, and what we've gone through. And he helps us back up so that we can keep going forward. Friends, though it's true that we will falter at times, though some folks may turn on us. Remember, when you use the name Jesus, people are going to think one thing or another and sadly, there are some people that can turn on you, turn on you on a dime. And while things may not always happen the way that we think that it should, still, friends, do we stick with Jesus come what may? Do we stick with him? You will fall on your face. People will turn on you because of him. And things may not happen the way that you think it should. But do we stick with Jesus nonetheless? It matters. Because lining the road that day were also the groupies. The groupies. Showing up at various points along the Lord's path. These were the people, and this is important, these were the people who followed so long as it was convenient. So long really as it, as it fit in their schedule. In the summer of 1995, I became good friends with a guy named Kevin. In addition to being a pro-class mountain bike racer, uh, Kevin was a sous chef at the Eceola Lodge, where we both worked in Linville, North Carolina. And the Eceola Lodge is a four-star resort. Now, some of you travelers, you know that that's a big deal. And that was Kevin. I mean, we had people from Don Shula that were there to General Westmoreland to all sorts of other dignitaries. They made their way that summer to the Eceola Lodge. And, and Kevin, again, not only did he have a world ranking as a mountain bike racer, but he was the sous chef. A sous chef is the assistant to the lead chef. To be a sous chef at a four-star lodge, that's a pretty big deal. But then the other thing about Kevin, always very positive. He was the sort of person that you like to be around. Now, I trust that every single one of us can think of at least one person. Now, for instance, I'm not that kind of person. I doubt there's a single person in the world that says, Tom Parsons, he's the kind I like to be around all the time, okay? Okay. Tom Parsons doesn't even want to be around Tom Parsons all the time. But every once in a while, we meet someone. We meet someone that they have the gift of personality. I mean, they have this, I mean, you could see Jesus almost in them. And, and you could be around them at any point. Kevin was that kind of person. But as I entered the kitchen that morning on August 9th, 1995, it became apparent that my friend was hurting. Kevin wasn't acting like Kevin normally does, and I, I inquired about this. And he quietly shared that someone close had died. 
Now, I expected that Kevin would mention the death of a, of a relative or even perhaps a, a fellow bike racer, but instead he gave me a name that sounded familiar. He gave me the name Jerry Garcia. And I, I wondered, Reuben, if you might... Uh, <laughs> you've confirmed my suspicions. <laughs> and I asked Kevin, I said, because I hadn't listened to the radio or watched the news that day, and, and I said, Jerry Garcia from the Grateful Dead? And he said, yes. And I mean, my friend was just devastated. Jerry Garcia had passed away, and, and I have to be honest, I never liked their music. I have to be honest, I could, and I've been a big, even rock music, okay? Uh, I've been a big fan of music my whole life, but I just never enjoyed the Grateful Dead. Um, but there were plenty of folks that did. And to the most avid fans went a special title. What's that special title? De Thanks, Ruben. You just keep compounding it, you know? <laughs> Don't talk about the story anymore, okay? <laughs> He's right. And you all knew it, too. Okay, he was just the one that had the guts to say, Deadheads, the most avid fans of the Grateful Dead, they're called Deadheads. This is an eclectic bunch. I mean, Deadheads range from old-time hippies wearing tattered leather to, uh, to young professionals with crew cuts and, and three-piece suits. Yet, no matter how diverse their backgrounds, Deadheads shared a common trait. They planned their yearly schedule in such a manner as to spend time following after the Grateful Dead while they toured the country. And it was like the Grateful Dead lived a perpetual tour. Okay, I don't think they ever stopped. And so deadheads, be it hippies or young professionals, they would plan their vacations. They would even select what job they worked all so that they could look at that schedule and determine where on that schedule that year they would be able to pick up with the Grateful Dead and then go from that city to that city to that city to that city. When I got out of the military, I worked um, concert security at what used to be Deer Creek. I don't even know what it's called now. Um, but when the Grateful Dead would come into town, what would happen is that all these deadheads, they would set up these tents on the outskirts in some field somewhere, and so you would have like a tent city, and I always likened it to a traveling circus on drugs because you would, you would have all these tents and there would be this haze over these tents, all right? Well, I never knew it until that morning, but Kevin and his wife, and his wife was an elementary school teacher, they were part of that scene. Now, I, I, I really believe that they... No, we didn't smoke it, all right? I believe that they didn't do drugs, all right? But they were still deadheads, and they would plan their schedules also, mostly according to hers, of where they would pick up and tour with the Grateful Dead. But here's the thing, as I listened to Kevin, it dawned on me that while my friend was certainly sad, he didn't truly know Jerry Garcia. He never even met Jerry Garcia. He only saw Jerry Garcia from afar. So what that means is that my friend wasn't actually mourning the loss of a person. My friend mourned the death of a pastime, of a hobby, if you will. And you see, that's how it is for groupies. For the groupies of Palm Sunday, though they admired Jesus from afar for his charisma for his tenacity, for the fact that he might very well deliver them from Roman oppression. But in the end, they mostly followed until it no longer suited their taste or schedule. An example, I believe, is found in, in John chapter 6. After teaching that he is the bread of life, Jesus turns around and, and he says, does this offend you? Then what if you see the Son of Man ascend, rise to where he was before? The Spirit, capital S, Holy Spirit, the Spirit gives life. The flesh counts for nothing. The flesh counts for nothing. The words I have spoken to you, they are full of the Spirit and life. Yet there are some of you who do not believe. 
there are some of you who do not truly know me. Hmm. This is why I told you that no one can come to me unless the Father has enabled them. From this time, many of his disciples, these are the groupies, many of the disciples turned back and no longer followed. Friends, it didn't fit within their schedule. Real discipleship is neither momentary nor shifting. And quite honestly, much of the time, it's not even convenient. I mean, real discipleship, guess what? It, hint, it, it infringes upon your personal time. It, it, it begs service from you. You know, I, I mean, for instance, there are people out right now teaching children's church and doing nursery. And all. You know what? They'd much rather be in here. And there are things that you do as well that you would much rather be in here or you'd be, rather be actively engaged with something else. But that's true discipleship. It will infringe. It's not always convenient. And it does ask of time. Instead, the belief of a sincere follower, friends, is both settled and sustained. It's not momentary. It's not shifting. It is settled and it is sustained. Like Peter expressed, it's a come what may sort of relationship. Um, soon after that discourse about being the bread of life, and it says that all those folks left, Jesus turned to his disciples and he said, you do not want to leave too, do you? It's one of my favorite parts in Scripture. Okay, this part that I'm telling you right now. And Peter spoke up for the other disciples, as Peter often did. And, and he said this, Lord, to, to whom shall we go? Again, this is one of my, probably my top five favorite things that I find in the Bible is this right here. Lord, to whom shall we go? All these other people have left, and, and now you're asking, do I want to leave also? Lord, who else am I going to go to? Who else is my great hope? Who else is filled with such promise? You have the words of eternal life. You are our life, Lord. You're not our hobby. You're our life. Third group, the rubberneckers. The rubberneckers. Of the four camps comprising the Palm Sunday crowd, it is merely my guess that I think that, that this was perhaps the largest. Like groupies, rubberneckers always look for a good show, don't they? And they could slow things up. You know, someone had a busted tire on the side of the road, and you just waited an hour and a half. Poor John Bonham, man, the guy was coming back from Georgia. Two and a half hours is what he had to wait in the mountains. Because, and then when he went, now I don't know what it was, but can you imagine doing that, and then you get past, someone blew a tire. All right, and that was it. I mean, rubberneckers slow everything up. They're, they're there for a good show, but with little appetite for truth. Here's the thing. With little appetite for truth, they live for the day, small d, not the day, capital D. There's a, a difference between those two. In other words, rather than long for what lies ahead, you and I, we should be longing for what is to come. You know, we should be looking ahead to a place that we can call our own, recognizing that we are strangers, that we are aliens here, that this is not really our home. Don't you ever feel that? That everything is not okay. And you and I should be longing for what's to come. But when it comes to rubberneckers, they prefer to remain with the instant gratification of here and now. It's an attitude I've always found conveyed in Isaiah twenty two thirteen. Let us eat and drink. For tomorrow we die. Let us stay stuck in the moment and not concern ourselves with what's to come. So while it was well within their curious nature to cheer for Jesus, 
as he approached Jerusalem. They quickly changed their tune when it became apparent that Jesus stood opposed to the prevailing culture of feel-goodism. Not only did this threaten the, threaten the rubbernecker's sense of a good show, but it raised the ire of yet another group that they wanted no problems with. Nobody wanted problems with them. The religionists. The religionists. And more than anyone, friends, this is the group that should have recognized Jesus for who he is. The one the prophets had foretold of long before. You see, the thing about the religionists is that they had the legacy. They had the knowledge. These were not dumb people. And they had the resources. They had the scrolls. They had every bit of information that you could get that day. They had it all at their fingertips. So they of all people should have recognized Jesus for who he is. But the religionists also had something else. They had a lust for power and control. And friends, that is dangerous. Therefore, as the Lord neared Jerusalem, rather than lead the people in open worship, the religionist quietly plotted his demise. Quietly plotted, behind the scenes. In their eyes, Jesus stood to dismantle everything they considered their own. Now, to help us gather an idea of this, I think of the local church. Here's what I would say to us as we try to figure out what does this look like. Friends, let us never forget, for instance, let us never forget that that this is God's church. Now, I I know, we say, well, my church where I go, and I I, I have to be honest, I still feel weird about that. I don't even, I like to try to find a different way. And I'm not saying it's bad. I think the Lord totally understands what we say. Well, yeah, my church is the Harper City. And that's fine. But we need to recognize this is God's church. And these, these are God's people. And even you, you are not your own. You were purchased at a price. The shed blood of Jesus. While religionists had the best vantage point for understanding every bit of what I just said to you, their self-authority, and this is an important part right here, their self-authority rather than God-authority, their self-authority rendered them spiritually blind. And the same held true for all who stood with them. And I would tell you that that was the heartbreak of Jesus. Luke chapter 19. As he approached Jerusalem and saw the city, he wept over it. He wept over it and said, if you, even you, had known on this day what would bring you peace. But now it is hidden from your eyes. Can you imagine the Lord's saying that to people today. I mean, we have so many broken hearts. I mean, even just take Blackford County. Can you imagine? And I think we're, we're, we're at one of the highest points in the county. Can you imagine if the Lord was standing on the hill and, and, and went up or went up to the, to the rooftop of this place and he looked over the county? And if he said this, if you, even you, had only known on this day what would bring you peace. How many people do we have in our county that they're looking for that? And they're looking in all the wrong places. But now it is hidden from your eyes. The days will come upon you when your enemies will build an embankment against you and encircle you and hem you in on every side. They will dash you to the ground, you and the children within your walls. They will not leave one stone on another because you did not recognize the time of God's coming to you. In closing, the more things change, the more they stay the same. Friends, we are there. 
you and I line the road. The timeless challenge is that by and large, we stand with one of those groups that I've made mention of today. Which one? And to help you again see a, a picture of this, I would submit to you, the way I've always looked at it, is that it was the groupies in less than a week's time. Remember, they start off with Hosanna. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And it wound up with shouts of crucify. I submit to you that in a sense it was the groupies who would hold the nail. That it was the rubberneckers who would swing the hammer. And it was the religionists who gave the orders. But friends, remember lining the road that day. There was also the devoted, the devoted. Let's take a look at the challenge this morning. John chapter 16, verse 22. Now there is in store for me. Now there is in store for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day. And not only to me, but also to all who have longed for his appearing. I have that scripture verse wrong, don't I? Oh, my word. Remember that whole midair collision thing that we're talking about? There you go. <laughs> when the preacher realizes he put the wrong scripture. <laughs> the words occur. What is it? Yeah, thanks, Gary. Yeah, I appreciate that. All right. Well, the words I want, all right? I promise you it's in the Bible, okay? <laughs> Jesus draws near, and you line the road. And I'm right there with you. I'm lining the road right beside you. Yes, please. Second Timothy. Second Timothy. Chapter 3. Chapter 3. 2 Timothy 3.8, which is not even close to what I have listed up there. I got it wrong, too. Stop, Gary. <laughs> well, I'm trying to find a chapter here. Chapter 4. Chapter 4, verse chapter 8. Four, verse is that eight. your final answer? 2 Timothy, chapter 4, verse 8. 2 Timothy, chapter 4, verse 8. Thank you. I knew you'd care about that, and I did, too. I appreciate it. 2 <laughs> Timothy, chapter 4. Verse 8, listen one more time. Now there is in store for me, thank you very much, you're awesome. Now there is in store for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day, and not only to me, but also to all who have longed for his appearing. Some folks lining that road long for his appearing. Some folks were going to stick with him, come what may. Jesus draws near, and you line the road. Friends, the challenge... Who are you expecting? I don't care how many times you've been to church. I don't care if this is your first time of going to church. I don't care if you've gone your whole life. I don't care right now if your life is on top of the mountain and everything is going great or if you are deep in the valley. Who are you expecting? Who are you expecting? Guaranteed, we fall into one of those four groups presented today. Let us listen to what the Lord has to say because, friends, it absolutely matters. This morning as we close, um, feel free to use the altar this morning if you'd like to pray up here. Perhaps there's someone that you feel led to pray for. Um, quite honestly, maybe we recognize ourselves as part of a group and we don't like the group that we're in. And, and ask the Lord, help me to change. God can always deal with honesty, friends. It's when we try to skirt the truth or we try to justify. Oh, that's the big thing. We're, humans are big about that. Well, I know what it says, but I had to. Let us not do that. That's nonsense when we do that stuff. And I've tried it also. And the Lord says, really? That's what you're coming at me with? <laughs> it's like, all right, that was kind of dumb, wasn't it? <laughs> many that line the road are the devoted friends if you're not part of that group today 
you absolutely can be. We have never gone so far that we can't stop what we are or perhaps even stop what we're doing and say, you know what? I'm going to stick with Jesus come what may. Today's a great day to make that commitment to him. And so I would encourage you, think it through as, as you sit in the chair or feel free to come up to the altar also and lay that decision before the Lord. Um, if you're here this morning and you know, maybe no one else knows, but you know, you don't have a story to tell about where you made a choice to follow Christ. Friends, I'll be at this altar up here. Please, please come and kneel next to me and just put your hand on my shoulder because I don't like to be bothered when I'm up at the altar and so I don't do it to other people. But each Sunday I come up here with the hopes that maybe, just maybe, someone will be so moved that they'll want to pray. And so I encourage you, this is one time, come up and put your hand on my shoulder. That's the only way that I'm going to bother you when you're up at this altar. I may come behind you and pray for you, but I'm not going to ask you anything. And, and that's fine when others do. It's just not how the Lord moves me. But put your hand on my shoulder, and I'm going to ask you, how can I pray for you? And you simply share, I want to follow Jesus. And I think today would be a great day to say, I want to follow Jesus, come what may. And I'll lead you in a very simple prayer to receive Christ. And then you will indeed have a story of where you made an intentional choice. Friends, the altar is open if you'd like to use it. Let's listen to what the Lord has to say. And let us all be challenged to consider which group are we part of. You, the devoted. Father, who else are we going to go to? You, Lord Jesus, have the words of eternal life. You, Lord Jesus, are our promised hope. We know that the world looks at so many other things. It looks at if we make a certain income or have a certain job or marry a certain person, or, or whatever the case might be. But in the end, you're the only hope that we have. And so who else are we going to go to? Lord, help us to recognize that every day, because if we will recognize that, then we will indeed stand with that group called the devoted, a come what may sort of faith. I'm going to follow Jesus no matter what. I'm going to follow him no matter how inconvenient it may become. I'm going to follow him no matter who may turn against me. I'm going to follow him no matter how much it may ask of my time or my talents or my treasure. I'm going to follow him. Come what may. Lord, I pray that for this congregation. I pray that for myself and for my own family. That you would find all of us. If not today, that you would sustain our lives until the day. That you would find every soul here this morning. Standing alongside the road. As part of that group known as the devoted. 
And then, Lord, furthermore, we ask that you would use us. And now there are some that may not want to pray this because they aren't sure exactly what this would entail. So I'm going to pray it for them. We ask that you would use us to perhaps reach out to those other groups, the groupies, the rubberneckers, the religionists, as we come across them. May the light of Christ shine through us, and may we have every opportunity to walk through the, through the door of reaching out to them because, Lord, there are still more people that you're drawing to that group called the devoted. We'd love to be a part of reaching out to folks. We thank you for loving us, Jesus. We thank you for coming back to get us where we are, where we've tripped up. You reach down and you gently pick us up. And you encourage us to keep going forward with you. Lord, help us to do that, come what may. We give you all the praise, honor, and glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, friends. Hey, remember, next Sunday, Easter, that is an easy, easy opportunity to invite people to come to church. And remember, those of you that are part of the Seder, Miss Kathleen will want to meet with you in a large tiled room. God bless you. Have a great day. Hey, Dave. Hey, one more thing also. I'm sorry I forgot to announce. There are blood pressure checks for anyone that want to get, get their blood pressure taken. Uh, our nurses are going to be in the classroom.